Today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not missiles, but microbes. Now, part of the reason for this is that we have invested a huge amount in nuclear deterrence. But we've actually invested very little in a system to stop an epidemic. We're not ready for the next epidemic. And so there's models like South Korea who took advantage of February, built up the testing capacity, and they were able to contact trace and their infections have gone down, even without the type of shutdown that because we're late, we're, we're having to do. So the swab, you know, should not be limiting. Neither should the various chemicals that help run the PCR machine. So we, we should be able to get to a South Korea type prioritized testing thing within, within a few weeks. Uh, South Korea did get a medium-sized infection, but then they used testing, enforced quarantine, contact tracing, and really bent the curve, uh, even though it looked pretty scary there for a while. Well, this is a a nightmare scenario because human-to-human uh, -human transmissible respiratory viruses can grow exponentially. And, you know, if we had kept on uh, going to work, traveling like we were, you know, that curve would never bend until you had uh, the majority of the people infected and then uh, a massive number seeking hospital care and, and lots and lots of deaths. So, you know, we've had to use quarantine, which is a you know, old uh, thing back from the, the days of the plague as our primary tool. Uh, fortunately, if we use that well enough, we should, uh, towards the end of this month, start to see those numbers level off. And then if we continue countrywide uh, and we're testing the right people to understand what's going on, which uh, is not the case yet, those numbers will start to go down. And then we can look at some degree of opening back up. the um, social distancing properly, we should be able to get out of this uh, with a death number well short of that. It's very important that those numbers are out there because a lot of people are still thinking, hey, isn't life normal? Not waking up every day to a completely new reality. And so I was very glad that those models are out there. Uh, you know, Dr. Fauci is doing a very good job of saying the numbers are what count here. And you know, the various models that we, Imperial University, do show uh, that without this dramatic behavior change, you could even get worse than that. But I do think uh, if we get the testing fixed, we get all 50 states involved, uh, we'll be below that. Of course, we'll pay a huge economic price in order to achieve that. Well, we don't know how seasonal this virus is. Uh, you know, it'd probably be good for the Northern Hemisphere if the force of infection goes down as we get into spring and summer, you know, and give us some time to get both the drugs and advance uh, the vaccine. It's, it, it is fair to say things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. And so, you know, the best people at the foundation uh, who are all about uh, high volume vaccines, you know, are working with many manufacturers, uh, not only on the safety and efficacy, but getting that uh, billions of dose capacity. Uh, and so like China, there'll be a partial opening up 
uh, which some jobs will resume, school will resume, but we'll have to be very, very careful not to have the rebound uh, until the vaccine comes. Well, there are countries like Taiwan who were exemplary, uh, saw the problem and really got the testing, community-wide testing uh, done very well. They prioritized who got tested. And so they won't either have the disease burden or the economic uh, effect uh, that other countries will have. Uh, China, by late January, had taken it seriously. And so, uh, you know, their ability to get the cases to come down has been dramatic. South Korea has done that. And so there are lessons uh, that we're learning from. Uh, and, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, we've got to get rid of coronavirus from the entire world. Uh, you know, the U.S., we can see how tough it is here. Uh, likely it'll be even worse in the developing countries who as yet don't have nearly as many cases. But when you have finite resources, you need to allocate them to where there's the most need. Certainly, the because people move around the country, we have to have the shutdown or else you'll have exponential growth that will spread back into other parts of the country. In terms of testing, uh, people have gotten confused and think it's just about numbers. The key is that you have a response to the test in less than 24 hours and that you're prioritizing the right people. And so although the numbers are going up, we're not yet focusing in on that you know, medical personnel or somebody who's keeping the electric network for the food distribution working and being able to say if somebody tests positive, very quickly test their contacts. And so, uh, you know, I do think, uh, you know, that allocation, uh, prioritization of testing will be a key tactic for us to get uh, into good shape. It's hard to put money into something where you don't know if it's going to happen. We do for fires because, you know, we've seen that over time. We do for war, in fact, you know, 600 billion a year. In that case, what would have been required, you know, is nothing like that. Um, you know, the ability to make a test super quickly, the ability to, to know how a library of drugs that would work for this ability to have the vaccine very quickly. I am sure after this, which is just such a gigantic uh, impact that we will put that money in. But between 2015 and 2020, uh, less than 5% of what should have been done was done. But people didn't get that this is the biggest single threat that you know could disrupt our way of life uh, which, you know, even having predicted that as a risk, I'm really stunned at how, you know, tough it is to go through this. Uh, you know, the medical cost, the economic cost, the psychological cost, you know, everybody's lives have been completely upended. Uh, and, and that's not just the United States, it's, it's almost the entire world. This isn't the worst case. That is the 1% or so case fatality rate uh, when your medical system is not overloaded. If this was smallpox, that would be like 30%. So this is super, super bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we will eventually get a vaccine. Even before then, if we do the right things, we'll be able to open up uh, significant parts of the economy. And, you know, so once you're, you're in the crisis, you're just doing your best uh, to deal with it. I'm sure, you know, once we get past this, we'll look back, understand what we could have done differently and make sure uh, that we're not letting it happen again, particularly because it could be even worse uh, in terms of the fatality rate. Mm -hmm.